Team welcome in, seismic PE example problem number seven. Let's get into it. Refer to the plan view of a one-story residential building with a wood structural panel roof diaphragm, as you see above. The roof has a four foot overhang. The seismic load is shown in the north-south direction, over here not drawn my north. The redundancy factor is 1.0. For the north-south direction, the roof diaphragm shear force at line one and two is most nearly what? For today's problem, we are assuming that at grid line one and grid line two, we have some type of vertical lateral element along those grids that are giving support to our vertical lateral system. In green, you see our seismic story force, and you might be thinking, well, uh, let me start to break down this problem. What type of material code or provisions am I gonna need to get into to uh, come to a solution. Uh, you kind of pick through the problem statement and you see, oh, they're talking about a wood structure and they make specifically talk about a wood structural panel roof diaphragm. Seems important, maybe I need to head to the NDS. In this case, you're not gonna be heading there today because uh, this problem is more so boiled down talking about load path. The type of the structure, the material with which they're building it of, doesn't really matter when it comes to load paths. So you won't find yourself in the NDS. Well, if we're talking about load paths and we're talking about, uh, you know, load on our structure, then I might need to head over to the ASCE 7. The load criteria for the building has already been defined. It's seismic lateral force, and it's already been derived and given to you as that 200 PLF and then the 50 PLF for the cantilever portion of the diaphragm. Really, you don't need any type of material code or additional help to solve this problem. This one is designed to test you as an engineer at a high level in understanding load paths and where load goes in a building structure, depending on the type of diaphragm that you have, whether that be flexible or rigid, as we know. So today we're gonna to be using more of that intuition as the engineer that you are to get the correct solution. Now, right before we dive into today's problem, I wanna announce a first for this channel and thank Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing. With thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI, there's something for everybody. Whether I was studying for the FE, the PE, or the SE, doing little problems each and every day before the workday began is one of the major things I contribute to my success in becoming a licensed engineer. And if you're out there studying right now and you think you need to go at it alone, don't. Brilliant helps you build this learning repetition and daily learning habit. And the best part, if you can't always make it into the auditorium, Brilliant lets you learn on the go with engaging lessons right from your phone. Whether you're exploring a brand new concept or squeezing in a little practice session, you can sharpen your skills anytime, anywhere in just minutes. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, you have three options. Visit brilliant.org forward slash Kestefa or scan the unique QR code on the screen now or head to the description below and click the link there. You'll notice any of these three methods gets you an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you, Brilliant, and let's get back to today's problem. Now, the first thing I notice is in this problem statement, we have a wood structural panel roof diaphragm. Those types of diaphragms can be idealized as flexible diaphragms. Technically, that is information that is spelled out in the ASCE 7. However, if you didn't know that off the top of your head, you, you could technically go there. So I said we don't need to go anywhere today. So because we have a flexible diaphragm, we know that we can idealize this diaphragm as kind of a simply supported beam on its side. We've talked about that in, um, in videos in the past. But let's draw our, uh, our simply supported beam. And we're gonna draw it in two sections here. That leaves us with two systems that boil down to something like this. You have a simply supported beam between grids one and two, and then you have a cantilevered post going from grid two off to page right. We have our load W, which was our 200 PLF, and then we have our load, I'll call it W prime, which was our 50 PLF. We know that we need to get the shear demand at grids one and two to solve this problem. That means we're gonna draw, I'll scroll down here, our shear diagram. If I can draw it somewhat accurately, yeah, it's not bad. Let's start with grid one. And we know for a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, we can get V equal to W L over two. And then we know that that is an equal and opposite reaction at the other end of the beam 
So over here will equal V as well. Let's plug in for those. V sub one, I'll call it, equals WL over two. If we plug everything in, we have a span between supports of 80 feet. That gets you 8,000 pounds. That is the only force that's going to find its way over to grid one. So that is the first part of our solution. Now, we know that uh, equal and opposite, so V1 is gonna equal V2, but the sum of V2 is going to equal V2, I'll call this left side, plus V2 right side. So the left side is the simple, uh, simply supported, and the right side is the cantilever. So now we need to find, we need to find V2, uh, two, do I want to call it two? I'm just going to call it V cantilever, which we know uh, you could dive into the steel manual if you didn't know these, these simple equations off the top of your head. They have some great tables in there that give you your shear moment deflection diagrams and equations uh, is equal to W times L. Uh, and we'll go W prime because W prime we said was 50 PLF. This VC we also said uh, calling it V2 right. All right, let's plug all that in. So V2 left, it's just the 8,000 plus W prime L, which equals 50 PLF times four foot cantilever, really small cantilever. This portion here is an additional 200 pounds that grid two is going to see for story shear. So summation of V2 is equal to 8,200 pounds and that as quickly as it came is the second part or the second solution to our full problem here so if we scroll back up i'll go green i'm going to say c is what we want to be going with here today i want to caution everyone that when you're doing this uh idealization of of a beam being representing your diaphragm that you do not draw it as one continuous solid beam and then you have basically that beam is continuous over that support at grid line two which creates inaccuracies when distributing your shear force to your different boundary conditions because we know that if we do have a continuous beam then you can translate moment across that joint and it creates different values across the length of the beam so you want to be careful about that thanks for watching Thanks for subscribing and thanks for interacting in any way possible. And thank you Brilliant for collaborating and sponsoring today's video and supporting the engineers of the future. This is Rich with Team Kesteva and I'll see everybody next time. Peace.